Hello everyone, I'm David, part of the Australian Student Christian Movement. Um, today is the anniversary of the forming of UCA, the Uniting Church of Australia. And so we brought some uh, great people together to kind of reflect on that. I, I want to acknowledge the, uh, the lands that we meet on. And it's different lands because we're meeting from different parts of the country. And because we are talking about the Uniting Church, I want to make specific reference to the lands on which Uniting Church communities uh, meet. And of course, our elders past, present and emerging. Chris, if we could please start with you first, tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do and some reflections that you have for us. Thank you very much, David. Yeah, my name is Chris Barnett. Currently, I'm in the Uniting Church Assembly project role. It's a six month role, particularly looking at establishing an intergenerational framework for ministry across the Uniting Church in collaboration with others from around the country. I'm coming to you from the land of the Bunurong people and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. For most of the last 15 years, though, I've been in a Vic Taz Synod role in the area of children and families ministry initially. And in the last few years, the title focus shifted to intergenerational ministry brackets, children and families. In terms of my broader Uniting Church engagement, I've been part of the Uniting Church since its inception, grew up in a Presbyterian church, then Uniting Church, and have probably been involved in a whole range of things that are quite normal for someone from a smallish church, Sunday school teaching, youth group leading, elder, councils of the church. It's been a fun ride. And can you tell us what it's like doing kind of intergenerational ministry? Yeah. Well, it's been a huge shift in, well, the whole life of the Uniting Church. When it first began, there was a real focus on probably what we'd call now children's ministry. And, yeah, there's a lot of energy, I'd suggest, in the early days. It then proceeded into what became known as Kuka, Kids of the Uniting Church in Australia, and like many churches, flourishing after school activities, great things happening on Sunday mornings, cooker campouts, incredible, incredible times. Then there was probably a shift in the along with the broader sense of what's good practice in ministry with children to the sense of children and families ministry, which I think was a good fit for the Uniting Church, that sense that you can't really do effective ministry with children in isolation from their network, their web of relationships. So there's kind of a season of children and families ministry. And then with the research that's emerged in the last probably 10, 15 years, the sense that if you want the best outcomes in terms of ministry with children and families, then it sits in a much broader environment, the whole church, that sense of interdependence across the different generations and the whole idea that an intergenerational environment is going to be most conducive to lifelong discipleship. So there's been a significant shift over time from a focus on children almost in isolation, but still part of the church, to children in the context of their families, their broader web of relationships, and now a space where there's a real emphasis on not generationally focused ministry, but inter generational ministry, recognising the interdependence across all the generations and the sense that if we want to hang together as the people of God growing in faith, uh, in uniting church, language, language, worship, witness and service, then that's best done in an intergenerational environment. And outsiders, do they have misconceptions about what intergenerational ministry is, what it's like doing children? <laughs> outsiders? insiders, you name it. Uh, one of the things I've learned in my journey, if someone tells me they're interested in intergenerational ministry, I get to say, fantastic. What do you actually mean by that? Because there can be a fair bit of confusion. I could talk for what hours about the theological, the biblical, the sociological, the educational, you name it, um, dimensions of intergenerationality. But the bottom line for me that I found most effective in communicating what it's all about is to define it in terms of the deepening, the creating of relationship across different ages. 
that's pretty much the essence of being intergenerational, how we relate to those who are different to us in terms of age and a focus on relationships that uh, reflect mutuality, reciprocity, equality, then respect and humility. So that's the core of being intergenerational. How does that then play out in all the different aspects of our life as the church, in our worship, in our mission, in our praying, our caring, our celebrating, our learning together? The big challenge, I think, is to embed this core notion of intergenerationality as relationship into the whole life of the church. And what's yeah. one of the theological reasons for intergenerational ministry? Oh, let's, well, some would say, let's begin at the beginning. So some would draw from Genesis and look that we were created to be in relationship right from the start. There's some new work emerging um, that suggests through the Old Testament, even if we can't necessarily point to intergenerationality, somehow that's caught up in the heart of God's covenantal relationship with God's people. Some people look towards in the Old Testament, that notion of it was the whole of Israel, the old, the young gathered together for the celebration of major festivals and events. Uh, some point to the intergenerational relationships. It's not just a one-way transmission of faith. There's young people in Scripture who influence the older. So we think of people like King Josiah, for example. So you can trace um, through the Old Testament when we get to New, well, New Testament and beyond. The notion of Trinity, again, is this is the way God, by God's very nature, is interrelational, mutual, reciprocal, equal, then maybe that's a model for us as God's people. Uh, New Testament-wise, we look at things like a theology of accommodation. What do we need as those who maybe have power, or who tend to be older? What do we need to give up in order to make space for the other, the younger, the more marginalised generations, who I should say are not only younger, they can often be older as well. We find in the church, believe it or not, that some of those, say, 90-year-olds and older can actually feel a bit left out, voiceless in the same way that younger people can. And if one more biblical theological image is that whole notion of the body of Christ, um, that interdependence of all the different parts. So as a quick snapshot of some of the theological, biblical resources that people draw on around being intergenerational, always fascinated by the question because nobody really asks, what's the theological, biblical rationale for being generational? <laughs> Fascinating that people aren't called to answer that question because there is a view that the whole siloing and generational uh, structuring of the church is actually a sociological or educational rather than a biblical theological construct and one that many would point to as, in fact, arising from the whole advertising industry. But that's a discussion for another time. Thanks for that, Chris. Uh, Megan, if we could hear from you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and a bit about Uniting World. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, well, I'm <laughs> a bit about me. I have been attending church since the beginning of time and um, I attend Rosary Uniting Church in Sydney. I'm a university student right now and I'm working part-time at Uniting World. Um, so I'm excited to give you a little bit of a talk about what Uniting World is. Many people don't seem to know about us. So we are a part of the Uniting Church. Uniting Church has three charity organisations, charity, more solidarity. So there's the Uniting World, which focuses on helping overseas, frontier services, which helps um, uh, the outback and then Uniting, which is about caring for all Australians. So as the Uniting Church, we seem to be hitting, we're trying to help as many areas as possible, which is quite exciting. And so 
for us as Australians, um, we live in this beautiful place and we actually are very privileged. So being able to help people overseas who by whatever means are less fortunate than us um, is a great privilege. So United World works in partnership with 18 overseas churches, church partners to support hundreds of thousands of people caring for the needs of whole people, physical and spiritually. We have around 25 staff. Many of us are part-time based across Sydney, Canberra, Brisbane and Bali. We are custodians of the institutional church partnership that have and will extend long past any of our lifetimes. Uniting World is one of the many parts of the body of the UCA. We are part of the movement of Christian unity. Today I wish to focus on, we may be a charity, but our work is not charity, it's solidarity. Our equal and shared humanity is what matters most, even if our life experiences are very different. We have hopes and dreams for the future. So do our friends in South Sudan, India, Timor, PNG, Kiribati, and every corner of the earth. Charity opens our wallets. Solidarity opens our hearts. Uniting World works in solidarity with and through churches across Asia, Africa, and the Pacific to address the causes and consequences of poverty, injustice, and violence in their communities. Our partners are salt and light in these places. They show up when others don't. They feed the hungry, they advocate for voiceless, and they work with their own churches and governments to address systematic is issues that stop people living life in all its fullness. This call to be light for others is something that our church partners embody. They give hope in situation, in hopeless situations. They are light in dark places. The world has endless stories of people putting themselves at risk to help others, but why do they do it? It is because they are called to do this work. They are doing God's work with our support. There are lots of ways other people can learn about Uniting World, including our website um, or joining us on our Lent event trip or um, our Christmas trip, um, which has just gone out of my head. Um, anyways, it'll come back and then I'll tell you. Um, so what we ask is for prayers and solidarity for our partners as they their resilience, bravery, and faithfulness help us to do God's work in communities around the world. Faith is the heart language that we share with our brothers and sisters all over the world. We are part of one global church, and our partners are light in dark places. And so too are we if we choose to be. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, uh, Megan. That was uh, wonderful. Sandy, if you can tell us a little bit about yourself and sort of reflections on the church. Thank you. My name is Sandy Yule. I'm in deep retirement as a Uniting Church minister. Had a very unusual career in the church, I have to say. I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people, the other uh, main Aboriginal group in Melbourne, uh, NAM, as it's now coming to be known as as well. And uh, I've been very exercised by the importance of getting up the voice, the yes vote for the voice in recent uh, days. Um, too many things to talk about with uh, the Uniting Church. It's the whole world in which I've grown up and, and put my heart and soul into over a lifetime. And um, there are so many dimensions and so many stories from there that I'd, I'd be quite happy to share, but the time is limited. I, I think I perhaps should say that I came to Christian faith mainly through being growing up in a minister's family. My father became a Presbyterian minister in, in middle age. And um, so I grew up in the Presbyterian Church. I was able to vote for church union in 1973 when we voted for it in the Presbyterian Assembly. And at that time, I was working for the Student Christian Movement as the General Secretary, uh, 1970 to 1975, quite a while ago now. Very formative. Um, the SCM uh, opened up the relationships across Australia for me but also internationally. And uh, the international relationships have always been very important in my view 
uh, and I have so many friends internationally as a result of having been in those roles. You just can't keep up with everybody, but uh, it, it takes you back to prayer. But you, just remembering them is, in a way, a kind of prayer for them. And I certainly agree with all the things that have been said about uh, relationship and uh, solidarity as being crucial for Christian life and faith. The Uniting Church, I think, started out on the question, what is it? What is the faith of the church? Uh, we've all got our particular spins on it in our different traditions, uh, but what is central to it? And the end result of 20 years of church union negotiations was a rather marvellous document, The Basis of Union, which is a minimalist document <laughs> explaining what we regard as the essential features of the faith. Uh, and the rest is, is falls where it will. Um, but um, the essential features are faith in Christ, uh, are belief in the Trinity, belief in the witness of the Bible, and so on. You know, these are the, the central things. Uh, my training is in philosophy. Uh, I did a, a philosophy degree as an undergraduate and then went on to study theology. And the church supported me to go to Princeton Theological Seminary years and years ago now to do a doctorate, which I completed eventually. So these are the kind of things that have formed me. And as far as I'm concerned, the SCM itself is very important because that was the spark which led to the formation of the Uniting Church. The fact that the leaders of Presbyterians, Methodists and Congregationalists, and I would add Anglicans and Churches of Christ, knew each other from their time in the student Christian movement as, uh, as students. And they, they trusted each other. They, they recognized value in each other. What a surprise. <laughs> Uh, and I, I just think that that's where the Uniting Church came from. Uh, we're, we're in the process of wanting to consider a change to our national constitution. I would say the Uniting Church is in a good place to support that because we know it can be done. I mean, we actually walked out of our previous constitutions in, as Presbyterian, Methodist and Congregationalist on an unknown, a journey into the unknown, trusting in the spirit of God. And I believe we've done okay in that. I don't think we're perfect at all, but I, I certainly think we've been attempting to be faithful uh, every step of the way in that journey. Um, and we deserve at least some degree of acknowledgement of that from churches that don't agree with us on this and that. Uh, also, we've had a, a calling to be an Australian church, that, that we need to be honest and honourable to God where we are here in Australia. Uh, and I think that shows up as well as anything in the relations with uh, First Nations, uh, that in the Uniting Church, we have the Uniting Aboriginal Islander Christian Congress, um, who is a wonderful body. And um, uh, we have a covenant between the rest of the, ch the church and uh, the Aboriginal section of the church since I think it's 1985 or thereabouts. And that's the basis on which we, we move um, forward. And we're trying to learn to walk together. And doing this is, in a way, uh, we, we I think our vocation as Uniting Church is some sort of pathfinder role for the church in Australia. Uh, scout, uh, you know, advance guard, uh, do what we can, learn from the mistakes, recognise more barriers and hurdles that we didn't realise were there until we ran up against them, uh, and use that to, um, to live our lives. Perhaps, perhaps that's enough initial rant from me, but uh, what question did you have? Thank you, Sandy. Yes, yeah, so this is the question part or reflection part. Does anybody have any burning questions that they want to ask or reflections they want to share about the church? Chris, do you have a, I'll put it on you first. Do you have a sort of reflections about the church, where it was, where it is now, where it's going? Yeah, yeah where it was, where it is, where it's going. I actually have memories of that day in 1977, that first service that I was part of. I was part of a community, a Presbyterian church that combined with the uh, Methodist church down the road. And I remember our little church being packed, packed with people on that day. After the service, there was a birthday cake that was cut by the oldest person in the congregation and the youngest person in the congregation. And that youngest person happened to be my little brother, who was four at the time. Fast forward to 1991, where I moved away, um, left home, and my brother was still the youngest person 
in the congregation. And for me, that's a little bit of a symbol of something about what's happened along the way. There's a sense that there's a, so much that was good and healthy and life-giving, and yet at the same time, there's been a story in terms of numbers of people gathered around worship that overall is one of decline. So there's this fascinating sense of so much that is great and fantastic about the life of the church, the impact of the Uniting Church in the world, not just Australia, but also at the same time, something that hasn't actually lived out the fullness of what we believed at the time we were being called to. And we jump forward for that was 1991 to today. And it's what's the Anglican term of that sense of mixed economy. I think there's really good things happening in little bits. There's stories of decline and sadness in other places. Sometimes those stories are side by side in the same community. So it's a fascinating space, but I think the question is the same as always. It's the discernment piece of, well, who is God calling us to be now and what is God calling us into for the future? So congregations wrestle with that. Presbyteries wrestle with that. Synods wrestle with that. The assembly wrestles with that. The challenge is, and maybe this is one of the big distinctives of the Uniting Church, is our commitment to discernment and mutual discernment as expressed through our consensus decision-making processes. So plenty of challenges and maybe one of the big ones, and I'm biased here, is how do we continue to grow into being a genuinely intergenerational church where the voices of the young, the not so young, the old, the much older can be heard, can contribute to our discernment and our future, whether we're 4, 44, 94. So that's some of the challenge, I think, going thanks. forward. Thanks for that. Uh, Megan, you mentioned that you've been part of the church forever. What's your kind of experience with it, your reflections on it as, it, as time goes on? Yes, um, thank you. Um, it's interesting what Chris is saying, um, because as a 21-year-old, um, I find that my voice is often lost or, you know, you don't feel, even if people are willing to listen, you don't see yourself having much value because there'd be people there for much longer. So uh, reframing um, that would is an excellent idea, but it'll be interesting to see how we do that. Um, so I grew up in South Africa and I joined the Uniting Church five years ago, going from Methodist Church to the Uniting Church. I've loved being part of the Uniting Church. And one of the proudest things for me is being part of an LGBTQ supporting church. And I know that the Uniting Church as a whole does not support this, but I think our coexistence of different congregations, being able to support and not support this, as still exist as a whole church body has been a huge thing to watch how we as this church which came together not that long ago and with all our different opinions and different views we are still functioning as one body as part of the global church I think that has been um, something which is really powerful to to watch um, because the world has changed a lot in what the last five years, 20 years, um, and I know we're going through Act 2, and as Sandy was saying, we are a church which has gone through change so we can do it again, and it's, I think it's um, really great that we're still here, <laughs> um, and that we're working out ways to exist in the future and not in the past. Thank you so much for that, uh, Megan, uh, very powerful. Uh, Sandy, do you have sort of any extra reflections on sort of the church today? Well, I think, I think one of the big lessons we've learned as Uniting Church is what Chris referred to, which is the move to consensus decision-making, um, where we do explicitly see ourselves as having to listen to all the voices. Uh, and I've been in meetings where the individual voices turned the decision from yes to no, uh, simply because of the value of what was said. 
uh, it can happen and and it should happen. <laughs> Uh, and um, I think that that humility has come in with the move to consensus. Um, it's also interesting that churches around the world, including uh, international church bodies, have looked to the Uniting Church to help them to turn in this direction as well, to turn to discernment. Uh, and the reason for that is that some churches know this totally instinctively, like the Quakers and the uh, Mennonites and some others that, that, that use consensus for generations. They don't quite know how to, how to put rules together to to make it happen for those of us who are, uh, are less willing to to listen. <laughs> so um, I, I've been in you know that that's been one of the joys in, in my time in the United Church to just see how something we learned in the process of our own discernment uh, has been internationally recognised and, and and valued. Um, the um, emphasis on discernment, I think, is critical. Uh, following the spirit is the only thing that's going to keep us um, faithful and on the road. And I'd, I'd say to Chris in particular that I think the decline in the church that we've seen comes from our activists and you know, sort of expansive consciousness, which takes us right out to the world and encountering the real needs of the world. And too many of us haven't really come back. <laughs> so the church looks as though it's quite you know, small and insignificant. But in fact, I don't think that's right. I think the church is actually the home base for that very expansive reaching out by all sorts of people. Uh, and some often who don't consciously identify with church anymore, but still are, are motivated in that way. And I, I'd include, uh, well, anyway, I won't, won't, make that <laughs> won't name names. I won't name names. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but I, I think there are plenty you could see in this space. Mm. Uh, Thank the you. other thing I'd say is that I think we have undervalued worship in the Uniting Church, prayer and worship uh, to me has become absolutely critical uh, for the continuing health and life of the church. We, this is not, shouldn't surprise us, <laughs> but it has. That <laughs> uh, we need to keep the balance between the gathered and worshiping life of the church and the serving and expansive life of the church and keep that more intentionally and uh, more humbly. Um, that, that would be my word. Thank you, Sandy. Now, to put you all on the spot, you'll all have to come up with one question for someone else. So if I start with you, Chris, do you have a question for Megan or Sandy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll ask Megan uh, a question. And how does your life in a local community sustain and energise your broader expression of faith? Oh, that's a big one. Um. Sorry, just give me a second. I just want yeah. to get the answer. I think this actually relates quite nicely to what I was thinking of um, uh, with coming to a university group where a lot of people you will find are immigrants. So I have a call to help those overseas because I've seen people who are less fortunate than me um, and it's one thing to be in a wonderful privileged country in Australia but there is a part of me which feels as has a bit of guilt because I'm in such a wonderful place but I know what else is out there in the world and I think that is a huge drive and just being part of a wonderful small community, being able to be able to help even in a small way, someone overseas um, or even not overseas, just being able to be part of a bigger picture. Because to me, Jesus's message was love one another as a global thing. And we as Christians are not great at that global message because we are very good at going we are right and this is wrong. And I think just being able to be helpful even in a small way, in whatever way that is, that's that's sort of the drive. Hopefully that answers the question. It was a big question. <laughs> question. That's right. Thank you. Thank you for that, Megan. Megan, do you have a question for uh, Chris or Sandy? Ooh, um, sorry, just bear with me. Um, Give Sandy a really tough, controversial one. 
Um, how do you see the, so with the Uniting World, Uniting World, Uniting and Frontier Services, um, how it's, how does the future of the Uniting Church work with those bodies? Because as I've been noticing, um, churches function as I'm a little church and we don't seem to function great as the Uniting Church of Australia. So how do we become the Uniting Church of Australia with all the churches and embodying all the organizations together? Oh, thank you. Thanks for the question. It's a hard one. The, the Synod of Victoria in Tasmania actually asked me to be part of a group writing uh, a paper about service in the church, in which we talked about service agencies as hybrid organisations between, if you like, the, the church and its aspirations and desire to help on the one hand, and government regulations and community expectations on the other. And uh, the, they always make all sorts of compromises in that space and have to. Uh, this is not surprise. Uh, so it's part of our mission to live in that space with all the messiness and uncertainty of it. Uh, and part of the problem is that uh, it's really hard to communicate the actual reality uh, of service in that space. Um, so we do our best and you, you have your you know, information handouts and all that sort of thing. But um, it's, it's um, a continuing challenge. And to my mind, it's important to own the difficulty and just say, this is what we have to keep working at <laughs> and not worry too much about our, our failures and our lack of success and our, you know, wanting to do more, um, but, but keep doing what is the most important thing uh, each year you know, and, and keep assessing. And that's where you come back to discernment. And it seems to me that we need to nurture the ability to discern well. Uh, that, that, that is that is what's been keeping us on the road properly up to now. And I would trust that rather than anything else much uh, for the future. Thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, does anyone have any final kind of reflections? Oh, yes. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to just go back to, to Chris and, and uh, ask him about um, his uh, assessment of the present functioning of the assembly, granted that we've had to reduce funding because assembly... Uh, work and like synod work it depends so much on funding uh, and we know that there's deep re reductions going on in in funding um how is your what's your, been your experience of that space yes my whole experience i've been in assembly for three months yeah. so i'm well qualified to comment on all that I think one of the distinctives of the Uniting Church is our, and not many people use the word, is our polity. This sense that each council, congregation, presbytery, synod, assembly is to, what is it, pay heed to the other councils. One of the challenges then is how does that look in practice, which is... Um, something that's unique, I think, to the Uniting Church in terms of structure in a society where pretty much everything expected to, is expected to be hierarchical. Yeah. So we're constantly experiencing this pressure of we want to be who we believe God has called us to be in the way we work. And as you've alluded to, Sandy, some of those quite appropriate government expectations in a range of areas, not just service delivery, but, for example, safe church, care of children, mm. um, have, are actually forcing us into a different model or way of being structurally than is our heart. So, for example, in that safe church space, we had to almost create a new way of synods to connect with each other in order to have an expression of safe church that met government community expectation. Obviously a very, very good thing, but a challenge to us as a church to make all that fit. Mm. So as we look forward, and this is part of we alluded to Act 2, which is a process that is in place of review, reflection, discernment as to how we might move forward in a range of areas, this question even around resourcing of the various bodies the councils of the church is a big one. 
Hmm. And I might be a little bit controversial here, but hey, who's going to listen to this pod? No, um, I'm going to say my suspicion is the most neglected piece of the church from a resourcing perspective has actually been <gasps> presbyteries. My sense is that presbytery is the most pivotal point of the Uniting Church, so almost that interface between congregation and the wider church. And even in my three months in an assembly role, I've come to realise, wow, Victoria and Tasmania, we're in a very different place, it seems, to most other presbyteries in and around the country in terms of the level of resourcing seems to be a bit more on average than what's out there. So yes, the way we allocate our funds and which bits of the Uniting Church interrelated council structure they go to is a big one and an ongoing challenge given the perception of diminishing resources in the life of the church. There you go, Sandy. Maybe not what you're expecting, but no, that's, hey, that's my take on where we are at the moment. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Megan, for um, your comments and uh, what you're doing. I'm yeah. mindful of the time. So does anyone have any final kind of reflections? Um, I do. So I was thinking about this quite a bit, um, this being a group based in universities and me coming from a organization which needs money to <laughs> exist and also um, the Uniting Church needing money to exist. We all know the world revolves around money. But I think as a university student, many others might be asking the same question of how do we support an organization if we support the work but we don't have the funds to support and I just was hoping to address that by saying um, we would appreciate any prayer and also if a person were to look at our website Uniting World or the Uniting Church and just learn about us and be involved in events um, I think that's the best way as a university student to be involved in these organizations and I think going through life, just being part of us, not um, I feel personally that that's the best way I can be supportive right now, especially in the current financial crisis. So that's just a reflection on my part, being a university student with no money, which may be valuable. Thank you for sharing that. Very true words. Sandy or Chris, any final reflections? Yeah, could, could I say that I think that um, we need to be supporting volunteerism as part of the picture? Yes. Because it's what people actually do and how they connect and, and what they offer to each other through relationship, which is nobody can put money value on it. Exactly. Yes. Uh, but yeah. that, that's the heart of the, the matter. And it comes back to Christian calling, that uh, Christ calls us to, to live openly and uh, in love with each other. Uh, and if we don't do that, then everything else starts to look uh, more more grim and more dire. Uh, but if we do do that, then it seems that resources, sufficient resources, do seem to come. And and uh, anyway, that's been my experience of the church and of and of life. I have to say. Thank you for that, Sandy. Uh, Chris, any final reflections? Yeah, it might have been implicit. But I wonder whether we've named in this discussion one of the other great strengths of the Uniting Church is its diversity in terms of its theological diversity, in terms of its affirmation of gender diversity, its multicultural diversity, almost any spectrum you can name. We are an incredibly diverse church, maybe not totally reflective of the Australian community, but, hey, we do our best. With that diversity, it's an absolute blessing and strength. Sometimes it creates challenges but I think it's part of the uniqueness of the Uniting Church is that we can embrace or hold together all that diversity and maintain a sense of unity. Thank you so much for that. And thank you all for joining. I really, really, really appreciate it. I hope you got something out of it. Yes. And thank you to you, David, for drawing us together and making well done, this space. Yep, well yes, done. Thank, thank you so much. Mm.